Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the WTF1 podcast. I just cannot get over you two waving every single... It's just become a thing now, hasn't it? You did it once in, in synchrony. Synchrony, is that a word? Synchronous? Synchronosity? Synchronous. Uh, anyway, we're here for the Monaco <laughs> race week. Uh, we've had two practice sessions. We're bringing you this podcast after some action because... When the off off week doesn't give you much, you have to wait till some Formula One cars go round to give us some news. And my goodness me, we've got some things to talk about today. Of course, joining me in this virtual podcast booth is none other than the WTF1 founder. Oh, God, the WTF1 founder, the greatest human being slash verified uh, person on the planet. And uh, please pay me at the end of the month. It's Tommy <laughs> Bellingham. Uh, and also, Katie Fairman, the WCF1 editor. And sorry, Katie, I don't usually, uh, you know, it's because Tommy, you know, makes me. So, and I think people I love the actually, way people actually people genuinely, genuinely believe that now uh, yeah, because it's true. Anyway, right. So let's talk about <laughs> Ferrari, first of all. They're back. The, the, there's a question in this sheet. It says Ferrari are back. They are back. And you can you can use me. I say they're back. They're back for one weekend because clearly their car works very well around here. Nice and heavy downforce. Lovely. At Matthew 2215, is Ferrari's pace legit or is it more down to all the teams doing their own practice programs? Well, Matthew, I wish we knew exactly what everyone was doing in terms of practice programs, but FB2 is usually known as a time where they do try some one lap pace. FB3 as well, of course, will be a good uh, sort of idea. FB1's just kind of a shakedown, really. But Ferrari, like four tenths clear of anyone else. Of course, you had the likes of Verstappen um, getting a bit of traffic here and there and not having the cleanest. Not many people had the cleanest hot laps, but Ferrari, one, two. Leclerc on top, didn't even do any running pretty much in FP1. Just goes out on his home track and pops it on provisional FP2 pole. No, good times. I mean, we didn't get to see the rest of the session because of... Uh, like towards the end of the session or because of mix crash where it was red flagged. But that being said, Ferrari did just look genuinely good anyway. Um, a lot of people did expect it going into the weekend because of how fast Ferrari were in that twisty final sector, you know, the chicane we all love uh, so much at Barcelona, um, which is always a good sign of how well people are going to do at Monaco. Um, I did actually see on the coverage that Lando even text Carlos apparently after after the Spanish Grand Prix and said he thinks he's going to win. So there is a lot of genuine hype around Ferrari for this race. It will be circuit dependent. I don't think we're going to see them challenging the likes of Mercedes and Red Bull every weekend. But for a one-off race, if they could be up there, it'd be absolutely amazing, wouldn't it? We will take it. We will definitely take it. I think I saw, I didn't write it down, but somebody had said this was the first time Ferrari had managed a one-two in a session since Mexico 2019, I think it was. So yeah, long time coming, but I'm sure all of us F1 fans are very excited to see them up there. Like you say, Charles had uh, some issues with his gearbox early in FP1, so I think he managed about four laps of Monaco, um, but in that time did manage to wave to some of his pals in the uh, balconies and stuff, which was pretty cool. Um, and then, yeah, came out in FP2, did the business, um, put it quickest, which is awesome. Um, and Carlos Sainz has been looking mega strong all weekend as well, so... I'm very hyped to see how they get on. It must be so weird for Charles Leclerc, mustn't it? To, that that really put into perspective, you know, when it says that are they, you know, Charles Leclerc grew up here and the track is essentially his front doorstep, but his mates in their house, like him driving past <laughs> in a Formula One race, waving to his mates. That's pretty, that was really cool. Yeah, I can imagine so. Probably not so cool that, he has problems, but no. at the same time, yeah, quite nice that he can wave to his pals. And I love how people are like, it's his home race, you know, he should know it. Back to France, he should be really quick around here. It's like, he doesn't drive around Monaco in an F1 car. Let's just <laughs> remind everybody that is slightly different to driving around in a Ferrari supercar, although be it not that much in terms of acceleration, but you get me. Uh, yeah, but if still, you saw the, if you saw the safety car lap, did you see that? that I think <laughs> F1 posted a couple of clips because obviously normally the safety car does a lap on uh the day before practice so yesterday um but obviously the circuit was still used as a road so the camera's on the safety car and i think it did an average speed of like five kilometers an hour and it was stopping at um various points to like kind of let people through and stuff so that was quite funny to watch 
Yeah, I think it was a, it actually got stuck at pedestrian crossing, didn't it? At yeah, one point, yeah, which yeah. is uh, very interesting. Uh, isolation gamer one. Will Leclerc ever beat the Monaco curse that seems to be hanging over him? Is it just down to bad luck, or is there something about his driving style that doesn't suit this track? Obviously, he had a great opportunity, didn't he, uh, in that Ferrari when it was good? But uh, he, but what exactly happened? It was 29, uh, 20, 2019 now, yeah. yeah. It was 2019. He binned it, didn't he? And yeah, I'm pretty sure he, he binned he did it. He did it in FP3. And then didn't get out and for then, qualifying. And then didn't get out for qualifying. I think that's... Start last. He and definitely he was, started last, yeah. didn't he? Yeah. I can't and he was making it. some serious moves. And I just remember watching it going, he's going to crash at some point. And then he crashed at the second to last corner, didn't he? He um, tagged someone. And yeah, it was just a bit of a scruffy race. And uh, generally, Charles Leclerc and street circuits haven't gone too well. I mean, Baku as well, where he had the I am stupid moment uh, and whatnot. But is it down to his driving style? I, I, I mean, I'd be uh, not probably the best person to judge that, but I feel like it's not a curse. It's, I don't think it's a curse just yet. He hasn't been in Formula One 10 years and hasn't won around Monaco. Like he's had one poor race when he had a competitive car. And since then, he hasn't really been able to race around there. So I, I, I wouldn't call it a curse just yet. It's not a George Russell not getting points at Williams curse. Yeah. I know it's a crazy, it is quite a crazy stat that he's never finished a race, that, but at the end of the day, it is only four races, two two being Formula One races. One of them, he had that brake failure, didn't he, where he smashed into the back of uh, Hartley when his brakes failed coming out of the tunnel. And then, yeah, a really scruffy race, which, yeah, while it was his own fault, you could argue that's, you know, the, yeah, two two Formula One races. Um it's hard to say, oh, it's a curse. You know, if it's four or five down the line and he's crashing all of them, then you start to to question it. But maybe maybe the fact that Netflix are here this weekend, he's trying to go for the Netflix jinx to cancel out the other jinx of Monaco and maybe And the other jinx of Yeah. So it's like, yeah, the double the double jinx, reverse jinx. Maybe that's what he's going for. That is big brain time if that's what he's going for. <laughs> But yeah, I think it's more just bad luck than a curse for Leclerc. Like you say, he's only had um, two opportunities here in F1. Maybe he doesn't get on so well with street tracks, like you mentioned uh, with Monaco before and Baku, that uh, maybe his driving style is just that little bit too aggressive. And obviously in street circuits, there's no room for error. So if you make a mistake, then that's you in the wall and that's you know, especially in Monaco, if you have a, an accident in FP3, then that will affect you in qualifying just from the short amount of time between things. So hopefully he is improving as ever with his driving and uh, getting more mature behind the wheel. And the Monaco curse, if we're going to call it that, will be broken this weekend. I certainly am hoping got everything crossed for him, which normally is probably a jinx, a jinx. So. Yeah, you've just pretty Excellent. much said Thanks, that he's going to break the curse. So... Uh... <laughs> These people can blame you rather than me now, Katie. Um, nice. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So Ferrari potentially back. I know it's FP2 and I'm, I can see the comments already. It's only practice. But come on. Ferrari it's haven't it's topped tight. a one-two session like that in a very long time. And uh, I'm not getting emotional. I've got an itchy nose. Right. Next up. <laughs> Lando hey, Norris. He, uh, yeah. I don't, I don't actually suffer from hay fever. Anyway, um, Lando Norris signs a new contract with, with McLaren, which... Uh, yeah, it just kind of didn't even really cross my mind as anything that needed to be really sorted. Uh, you know, Lando said in an interview after, I think it was FP2, saying, you know, he was kind of nervous to bring it up to Zach Brown and didn't really know how to kind of, you know, sort of start these conversations. And uh, it obviously it got all sorted and, and whatnot. It's Rise NK says, thoughts on the contract deal with Lando Norris. And do you think that McLaren will soon be back on top with him? I mean, it makes absolute sense for McLaren to continue with Lando Norris. I feel like his progression has been very noticeable to see. He's been getting the absolute maximum out of that McLaren. And it also shows with the likes of Danny Rick coming into the team, or, you know, proven race winner, that Danny Rick hasn't just come into the team and trounced him. It shows that Lando's doing a really good job in that McLaren. And why would they change uh, their lineup with Lando, who's you know been part of the team for many, many years since he was a very small boy? So, yeah, I think... They're a winning combination, to be honest. And I think if McLaren continue with the run of form that they're you know, going from year to year, they could easily be race winners and championship contenders with Lando at the at the helm. And, uh, well, whether Danny Rick will be alongside him, if, if Lando beats him for maybe a season or two, will Danny Rick stay? Who knows? Because, I mean, that's something that is a kind of a running trend of Danny Rick going from team to team. But 
yeah, I think it's a it's a great move for McLaren and Lando to stay together. Yeah, this, like you say, it came out of the blue. Though I was very surprised of all the times for them to announce him because you know it's not like his drive was under threat or anything. You know, he's been driving amazingly well. Um, I guess just another nice PR boost for McLaren of an already quite hyped weekend. But I I think it was Deresta that said on the courage and coverage, and I kind of have to agree with him a little bit that I feel like McLaren got the better deal there. Not not saying that McLaren aren't going to get better. And obviously Lando is still young. I think there is a uh, the problem is with people like Verstappen, we kind of mentioned it with George Russell and Mercedes, that these drivers, you kind of almost expect them to be winning races by 24 or they're finished kind of thing. Um, but Oh yeah, how's that Lando Mercedes move looking? Yeah, exactly. But I mean, that, but the, he did mention that, uh, that they were mentioning that on the coverage that, you know, we don't know what's happening at Mercedes. And while it's a massive long shot, um, you know, Lando's essentially just gone for this multi-year deal which that seems to be the the in trend at the moment uh these multi-year deals with teams i know charles leclerc signed for till about twenty thousand and sixty two, <laughs> um and verstappen the same like doing these massive deals that seem to last ages so um yeah it's it's obviously great for him but um i guess it kind of sets him at mclaren that if they don't start improving uh and yeah it kind of drops him out of that Mercedes drive that we did mention, you never know, could happen. <laughs> I guess we don't really know, obviously, the the absolute clauses within his contract. I'm sure if it's a multi-year thing, there'll be some sort of performance clauses in, in both camps, right, for the team and also for Lando. And let's not forget, he's 21 years old. Uh, he's <laughs> very new to Formula One. To have a team like McLaren back him for a multi-year agreement, I think is great for his career. And... So, you know, so what if McLaren drop off, you know, in the next couple of years or or whatnot? We're coming into the new regulations where we don't know who's going to be on top. That's the beauty of it. So this whole talk about Mercedes and Red Bull seats, McLaren and, and even Williams could even come out of nowhere, probably not winning. But, you know, th- there it's are like teams there. That, yeah, <laughs> it's a bit of a, a bit of a roll of the dice, to be honest, yeah, because yeah. it is huge changes to the regulations. And McLaren is such an enormous outfit that. I don't, yeah, it's better to stick with someone, you know, a proven, one of the most, you know, um, winningest, that is a word, uh, team in in Formula One. Stick with them, I say. And I think that I don't think there was any uh, better situation for Lando at this point in his career. I think you're right. I think that's a very slim shot that he could have gone to Mercedes. I mean, we did talk about it after his Imola performance. I think it was one of the questions that came up. Um, but I think, yeah, with, with the change of regulations, it makes so much sense to stick to what you know, go somewhere where you're comfortable and that you can have the easiest transition into these new rules rather than maybe making a switch to another team for 2022 and being out of your depth in a car that you don't really, you know, you're not to grips with and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I think it's a, a great deal and I'm excited to see Norris and Ricardo feel like they're a very stable duo I know we've only had four races of them together but they seem like a, a pairing that will get on well I mean Ricardo was very complimentary to Lando um, in the press conference this week which is actually quite a refreshing thing to see I know it, it might not last but for now for him to be so complimentary against Lando and say you know although it's only early days and I'm getting settled into the team and there's going to be more from me performance wise as the year goes on you know still saying hats off to Lando he's done a brilliant job which he has I think he's definitely my standout um, alongside Charles Leclerc for this year so far I think they've both delivered really well but Excited to see what's going to happen with McLaren, especially with when they get more to grips with this Mercedes power unit as well. Indeed. I think uh, another standout is Carlos Sainz, to be honest. I think yeah. he's obviously he had a very tricky Imola, but generally I think he's the best of the newcomers into the teams now in terms of being how close he is to his teammate and uh, really starting to come into his own, considering, you know, we're, we're not far at all into the season and we've had very limited running in pre-season testing as well it you know it is a huge learning curve for a lot of these drivers and I think Danny Rick can only go down the complimentary route I don't think he can really say much else because he hasn't been good enough of course Spain was a good 
a good example of him showing his pace and and improving that in that McLaren. But over the course of the the races we've had so far, the other ones weren't weren't great at all. So yeah, let's see. Let's see. I'm I'm really interested. I'm I'm a little bit concerned for Charles Leclerc with how close Carlos Sainz seems to be um, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, now as we come into Monaco. Of course, only FP two. Blah blah blah. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting one. But I yeah. wonder. I wonder how much of like a statement it is from Lando as well to be like. I'm with this team. This is kind of my team almost because you saw it. Um, you know, I know don't don't believe everything you see in Netflix, but obviously they were hyping it up like Zach Brown being, you know, absolutely adores Lando and it's and it's kind of he sees the future with Lando as this guy that's I think gonna it's grow. Obvious, though, yeah, that, it's gonna that, that grow obvious, with it's it? gonna grow with McLaren. He's the perfect McLaren driver for various reasons. And um yeah, maybe it's like a bit of a statement of intent as well to be like, this is my team. I'm I'm going to grow with this team. When you do have, you know, you've seen what, uh, how much of an advantage you get um, when, when you've got a team built around you, like a, like a Verstappen or whatever, you know, I guess, you know, Lando leaving, it could be a massive risk if he goes to another team and then they put all their backing behind, you know, say he goes to Mercedes with George Russell and they put all their backing behind George it looks like a stupid move, doesn't it? So. It does indeed. It's exciting times, you know, as a, when you've got young drivers, Max Verstappen and his home at Red Bull, you've got Charles Leclerc and his home at Ferrari, you've got Lando and McLaren, and you've got George Russell at Williams. Uh, I'm sure that'll change. But, <laughs> but <laughs> maybe Williams will get back next year. We don't know. Uh, but but yeah, it's, uh, it's exciting times for Formula One moving forward and which camp will win is going to be very interesting to see. Uh, speaking of Lando and McLaren, let's talk about the, the livery. Uh, which was uh, very, very out there. Michael MJTH, having seen the amazing retro McLaren Golf livery for this weekend, what's your opinion on having classic liveries be a thing for the future Grand Prix? Maybe make it a Monaco special thing. I feel like Michael pretty much looked to my Twitter, to be honest, because uh, that's basically what I said was that, yeah, I think Monaco, as much as the uh, racing action is amazing, yeah, processional, um, <laughs> Monaco needs to exist in Formula One, I think, for you know, the history. And I've already admitted to Tommy, you know, fine, Monaco's great, deserves <laughs> to be on the calendar. But let's make it a different kind of thing. You know, if we're going to accept that Monaco isn't just, is going to be a pretty, yeah, it's going to be an, not going to be a great race unless it's raining. Um, yeah, let's make it something that makes it exciting, having these McLaren liveries and, and whatnot. And I know the likes of Haas may struggle to, whip out a classic livery but they don't have to of course no, they don't have to run like a blank livery. NASCAR, NASCAR yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah or just have fun with it you don't have to necessarily be a historical thing anyway I, i'm 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 completely on board with that i really like the mclaren livery although it took me half a day to really kind of rack my brains around whether i did love it or not which triggered a few people but i just needed to absorb it and you know everyone has their own opinions and eventually i got there and so yeah yeah it was in the um i think it was the Hass the Hass Illegal Livery podcast, we had the conversation of like, should we have these kind of, yeah, a retro race? Because NASCAR recently had uh, something called a throwback race um, where basically every team is encouraged to run a retro design. Like you say, some might be new teams, but you, you even had some NASCAR teams that were like, I want to pay tribute to a 1970s Ferrari livery or something. Um, and it just... It's, it's a sponsor's dream and with Lib Liberty in charge, they seem to really be embracing this sort of thing. Uh, whereas obviously in the Bernie era, definitely not. And there, there, there are obviously strict regulations about liveries and you don't want people changing it all the time, like an IndyCar, because it just gets confusing when one week you turn in and you're trying to work out who's in what car, like there's a completely different kind of car than last week or whatever. But one special race a year where at Monaco, yeah, where everyone runs a retro livery you'd have livery season again where the week before everyone has their own special reveal so it's amazing marketing for for the events and you know the the sponsors and the sport is such amazing publicity and i mean the 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 hype of the mclaren golf livery has been absolutely wild i think it was uh yeah it's our most liked ever instagram post um that one was so there's such a huge hype for it and clearly that's something that a lot of the teams would be like yeah i want to want a bit of that as well so maybe maybe it could be a camo livery soon come yeah maybe one day 
please. I think that'd be great. I mean, Formula One is one of the only sports that's got such a rich history. And I think that having the event at Monaco, obviously there were Grand Prix, F1 Grand Prix in Monaco, um, way, way before F1 became an official championship. So, I mean, look at Charles Leclerc. He's got a helmet that pays tribute to um, Chiron, who was one of the we, um, Monaco Grand Prix winner in, I think it was 31. Um, but obviously that wasn't classified as an official F1 race because it was a long time ago. Um, but yeah, I think why not use Monaco? It's so much history there and having these retro liveries would be awesome. We've seen the incredible PR and media attention that McLaren have had from this livery. I mean, golf has had enough media attention to last them the rest of the decade. Like, I don't think I've ever heard the, the term golf used so much in the space of just a few days. So I think that'd be awesome. I mean, Tommy did do an article on the site explaining like why he wanted this to happen and I just agree with everything he says. And that's not him telling me to say that either. <laughs> <laughs> I can see the gun under yeah, the table. He's back again. <laughs> now, Tommy's only writing that article to keep his verified tick on Twitter. It's whatever that's, that's any <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I know there's been so much golf sponsorship that I've wanted to get my clubs out and it's not even the right one. But like literally just there's golf everywhere, isn't it? Hey, I actually do want to get my clubs out. It's terrible weather. Um, yeah, no, it's... Uh, I, I, I guess there's a there's an element of if you do it like if we go from this one special thing to doing it all the time it will kind of take away the special feel of it so if they do it right and just do it for monaco or whatever i'm all for it now let's talk about some monaco changes sisodia yash 97 do you think that something like a split qualifying which was used by formula two today uh, can be implemented for formula one as well for monaco after seeing how many drivers were finding it difficult to get a clean lap in i wouldn't like to see it i don't like split qualifying i didn't really enjoy the f2 split qualifying to be honest because it gives the second set so essentially it was set a and set b set a go out first 10 drivers they set the fastest times they possibly can and it basically seals each row of the grid. So those 10 are the f- or 11 are the first 11 rows on the grid. Then the second set go out and they, 10 or 11, I think 11, uh, then also set their fastest time. And then whoever is the fastest goes on the first row. And if their fastest time is faster than the set A fastest time, then they're on pole. I don't like it personally because it kind of takes away the jeopardy a little bit of qualifying because... Yeah, and it and it really did as well because Terry Pochair put an absolute stonker in. And as much as everyone was complaining in set A that set B would have more grip down, Pochair just popped an absolute worldie in. So for me, no, I don't like split qualifying at all. I think they just deal with it. And, you know, that's just, that's the beauty of qualifying. If you can't find a space and there's a bit of unlucky, you know, unluckiness, then, uh, <laughs> then that's just the way the cookie crumbles and it makes for an exciting race. Don't do that, no. Yeah, totally agree. It's part of the Monaco charm at the end of the day. People want the order to get mixed up and it's a bit of unpredictability on a unique circuit. Um, I mean, guaranteed if Matt, uh, Max Verstappen gets blocked in uh, qualifying on Saturday, qualifies sixth and Hamilton's on pole, this will be the new rule that we have to enforce to stop Hamilton winning again. Um, but I'm sure if Hamilton's the one getting blocked, everyone will be like, wow, Monaco's great, isn't it? So unpredictable and Charles Leclerc's on pole or whatever. So, you know, you love, you, that's part of the, a part of Monaco. It doesn't need to be split up. And if anything, you get, it gets whittled down anyway with this new knockout, new knockout. I'm sounding very old now. Uh, like new-ish knockout format that we've had since 2006. Um, yeah, it's really new, Tommy. That's yeah, really new. Years, mate. <laughs> See, so, yeah, just Monaco makes me feel like I'm 10 again. So I just, I'm instantly back in like uh, a child. Um, but yeah, it, I, I wouldn't like to see it personally. It's just, I don't, yeah, I agree. I don't even like it in F2. I don't really see why you've got an hour, like, give them an hour session. You've got plenty of time to set laps. And if you get blocked, you can get blocked at any track. You can get there's blocked only two to bar- cars in F2 as well, isn't there? Yeah. And I you can, can understand get- if it was F3 where there's 30 mm. odd cars. And I know it's quite bad, but you can get blocked to Bahrain. And they obviously don't take it that seriously because someone qualified seven seconds off the pace and they've allowed <laughs> them to race. So uh, they're obviously not that bothered about um, it being a safety thing. No. Oh, that's an interesting take. <laughs> but yeah, no, I think. I watched the F2 quali earlier and like you said that all the suspense was sort of just lost and dissipated among the fact that it was split into two I just didn't like that at all and although Monaco is you know a short track in comparison to some of the other places we've gone to 
you just have to make sure you schedule your times out right and that's all part of the strategy making sure you go at the right time that you know uh, you're not going to get blocked on track. I'm sure that it's inevitable that we're going to see some big traffic come Saturday when those guys are setting their quality times, but that's Monaco. Exactly. And if someone blocks, they get a penalty. That's simple as that. Uh, and obviously there are going to be points where they're starting flying laps and things that will uh, you know, just be bad luck on the person that catches them. But yeah, don't change it. It's uh, Yeah, it was not a fan of that. Um, another question, Melon underscore Twitch. Should Monaco change its format to make the racing more entertaining for fans? No, what format? Unless you get rid of the walls and you, you know, make Monash another a few track. buildings. Oh, yeah, if you get rid of the walls, you're in the sea. But I, <laughs> I don't know what you can really change. You know, shorter races, nope, still hard to overtake. Longer races, well, that's not going to happen. The same race, yeah, like just, there's nothing. Like, even if you had reverse grids, it would still be difficult to overtake. So, for me, there's nothing to change. We embrace Monaco for what it is. I've gotten over it. I'm not just going to bash Monaco, Tommy. I can see your smug little face from here. <laughs> and yeah, you just embrace Monaco for the heritage, the history, the, the amazing qualifying that we'll see, especially in Q3. The race, there might be some strategy involved. That's it. Exactly. There won't be overtaking. I'm not going to sit here and pretend, oh, Monaco is going to be the best race ever because there'll be loads of overtaking. And no doubt, you know, this this uh, weekend as well, even if we get an unpredictable qualifying and a nice mixed up grid and something crazy happens, it will still not have much overtaking. That is Monaco. That is the unique thing about Monaco. I get people don't like it, but there's so much more to enjoy about Monaco than just overtaking. Like, and that'll say, be... This... <laughs> and Tommy will be releasing a one hour solo podcast on the matter. Yeah, I could do. I could hunt about it for ages, but. <laughs> Tommy you know i love it and we'd be doing the watch along uh, on saturday which i can't wait for because monaco qualifying is genuinely one of the most it, 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 that is the race really isn't it at the end of the day and it's that that event is as good as a lot of the races because it's just so special and yeah there might not be overtaking but all right mate chill out it's one it's just one better than all the races all right chill out i said, <laughs> I said, it, was, races, I said it was all right some but... races better, better than probably, france yeah. better than yeah exactly yeah. i'd much rather see monaco to have qualifying than some of the other tracks on the calendar um and it is just bonkers like when i saw it again and you saw you now not pretending it's it's not great with these cars either because they're so wide and we saw an amazing race in formula e uh where there are a lot uh thinner cars um and katie you actually shared a um someone posted on reddit a, a stats piece where it was like someone had plotted every single overtake of every race since about 94 and there were 28 overtakes in 2011 so i can't remember what happened there i think it was when the tires were shredding or something uh, and i think there was two last year um so the cars really aren't suited but i don't know there's just something quite ridiculous about about it that you just think that track has not changed since the 1920s and these ridiculous cars are still going around it's yeah it's good thankfully <laughs> yeah the safety has definitely improved when you see back to those old clips like it's just phenomenal to think that safety just just apparently just didn't exist in those days you know people flying off into the harbour and stuff but yeah no Monaco is challenging for overtaking I think it was the 2003 Grand Prix there was not a single overtake in the whole race which is only one of three f1 races i think that's happened in um certainly in like the last 30 years or so so yeah but then when i watch monaco i love it for just the fact that you can see these drivers are on their absolute limits i think it's nelson pk once described driving around monaco like riding a bike around your living room which i mean if you're nelson pk your living room's probably blimmin massive anyway so it's probably not that great a comparison but for maybe somebody like me with a nice little modest living room it might be a bit more of a challenge but and that was with the old f old f1 cars new cars <laughs> probably like riding a bike around your like downstairs toilet or something <laughs> <laughs> good luck with oh, that a little shed or something quote. yeah but I, I can understand why people don't like it, but it's for one race. We have a 23 race calendar proposed. Like if you can try and grit your teeth and bear it or just take a Sunday nap, like there we go. There's your alternative, but I would love for it to be kept on the calendar. 
Good stuff. <laughs> it had to come up, didn't it? At some point, us, you know, we were just saying what. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> You've gone. Oh, I froze. You did. And now I'm back. Don't worry. <laughs> Uh, I was just saying it's funny about the the fact that we're just talking about the format and all of a sudden we're talking about keeping Monaco. I mean, it just it just naturally happens, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, Robin's formula. If you could, would you redesign Monaco? And if yes, what corners would you change or get rid of? This isn't Minecraft. We can't just build <laughs> on top of a sea. You know, it's, yeah. it's a street circuit for a reason. It's not it's not like we're you know, one of those pop up street circuits like Melbourne, for example, or whatever. It's it's literally a street. So. No, <laughs> I think like, there isn't yeah. really much you can change. Obviously, you'd want to make it wider, but then you'd literally be getting rid of people's homes. So <laughs> yeah. I'm not a fan Sorry, of Sorry, Charles. <laughs> yeah, and your house mates is gone. just going to bulldoze your friend's house <laughs> yeah. down. Sorry, Charles, but your house is gone, but at least you can overtake this year. So, uh, yeah, you can't, can't do anything, can you? It's like, like say, part of the charm is the fact that it is this track. No other track has stayed quite the same other than maybe Monza um quite so similar since 1920s even so yeah that that is part of it yes it's really hard to overtake but like we said the form the Formula E they raced on the full track um this year for the first time and there's quite a lot of overtaking there and you never know with the new cars might get a little more but it's never going to be the greatest track for overtaking it just is what it is and it can't be changed so it exactly. is what it is gotta love it for what it is you know embrace its flaws and all that no flaws Mumbo, jumbo. perfect in every way <laughs> yeah and as soon as you start changing monaco it isn't monaco then it loses the history because it's not a not it's not monaco so can't win really um but yeah sorry robin's formula if i came across as aggressive when you asked if we could redesign it but uh it's, yeah, it's <laughs> no not it's not minecraft <laughs> i was doing it in for tommy uh, it wasn't yeah my yeah I wish i've got my gun out again uplift ready. it and uh <laughs> Matt, anyways please. <laughs> please stop mentioning mentioning gun we want this yeah, yeah. right <laughs> <laughs> who's getting pole 95 moro asks who was your bet for pole uh my, I, I think hamilton's getting pole you're welcome ferrari fans yeah uh Heart says Leclerc, head says Hamilton because he always managed to do. But but they're underdogs this weekend. Apparently, you know Mercedes. I think you know they're 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 really playing it down. Probably going to finish back row. Hamilton I think they've done might that not twenty thirteen. Yeah, I think Hamilton might not even make the one hundred and seven percent. They're really struggling. So um, <laughs> it'd be amazed. You know, even if they finish top three, it'd be a massive effort from from them to get there. So we'll Forward see. Slash S. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go different. I'm going to save a stop and pole just to change it up a bit. Is that please it? Just change it up? No. Please don't bid <laughs> it in FB3 again. Yeah, I think my, one of my predictions was actually stop and crashing at yeah, some point during the weekend. So, uh, so yeah. But uh, interesting that Ferrari looked really, really strong. And the one time they looked really, really strong, every team has an extra day to work out why they weren't, weren't quick. So, <laughs> like, fingers crossed, Ferrari continue their form. Obviously, every fiber of my being, a part of my brain, says Charles Leclerc pole. But I think if Hamilton... it is a Charles Leclerc um, pole, you definitely want to be watching the watch along on uh, Saturday because I... it will be an yeah. absolute picture of that. headphone warning. <laughs> if, you the, that the, if you thought the Imola one where we're like, <gasps> Yeah. Oh my God, Lando <laughs> yeah. might get pole if Charles Leclerc somehow does it in that Ferrari. Uh, yeah. Anyway, look, we're getting far too sidetracked because I'm getting excited about something that's completely hypothetical. Um, that's it, Tommy. Final thoughts. Oh, um, you've had your vaccine. Oh, I d yeah, I have. I just had my vaccine, so I've managed to survive. I hope I've not been saying like weird things about you know like i really like the williams livery now or stuff like that like if you could have said that's just side effects from from the vaccine but um you're gonna say you hate monaco <laughs> yeah um i'm trying to think oh actually one thing i will say you did briefly mention it uh f2 poor chair 17 years old what a unbelievable lap that is um i saw a stat where he's not even uh, at the legal age to drive a car around monaco uh, like a road car, um, and he's put it on pole for, for F2, which is pretty incredible. And I think he said that he lived half an hour away or something from Monaco, so it's pretty much his home race. Um, yeah, 17 years old to put it on wow. pole. 20th Amazing of August is stuff. Amazing stuff. Unbelievable. That's crazy. Katie? 
Uh, my final thoughts is just that it was nice to actually meet you in person last week, which is wow. really technically a final thought, but I just I mean, thought I'd mention we it. Had, we had met you before. Yeah, but. but like the three of us actually got a chance to meet in person and not yeah, through the did. virtual podcast booth, as you call it. So We did, and there'll be a cameo nice. of you in the next WTF1 video going out tomorrow. So crikey that's tuned a to scary that. thought <laughs> yeah it's it's brilliant um but uh, okay cool thank you to tommy thank you to casey my final thoughts are please god charles leclerc poll thank you so much for watching this wtf1 podcast enjoy the monaco grand prix weekend of course we will be back for the quality watch along on saturday internet's best reactions on sunday the podcast again on monday are you not entertained good perfect tommy's not entertained He's no looking- sorry frank was just uh <laughs> shake having a shake Frank's such an attention seeker. Thank it you is. so much to everybody for watching, listening. Hashtag WTF1 podcast if you want to get involved next time for the uh, race review podcast. There's Frank. Yeah. That's all <laughs> Give we us care a wave, about. Frank. Give us a wave. Oh, he actually kind of did. Oh, that's because you're forcing him. Perfect. <laughs> Goodbye.